قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad coming to you every Sunday at 4 o'clock here in Mecca region. Our first caller is uh, Sumayya from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So my question is, um, my sister once, um, she, she was about to become pure, but she did a mistake. She didn't check um at future time she checked the duhur time of a, of the of the last day of her period because she became pure on duhur but she did check on fajr she was sleeping so i told her just pray duhur but that was a mistake you should have checked at, at fajr time so w was that correct yes it was correct because the default is she's on her menses until proven otherwise and due to the fact that she was unsure at Fajr time that she was pure, then the default remains as it is, that she is on her menses. And once she discovered that she was pure Dhuhr time, she only prays Dhuhr and Allah knows best. Musa from Azerbaijan. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, uh, is holding the shower on your forehead and moving it to right and left enough to make all the face uh, wet in wudu as it flows down? But I still think that the water doesn't reach uh, the zone which is uh, the lower part of lower jaw and a bit below ears, like the corner of lower jaw. It's this is something you have to be certain of. How would I know? So the easiest, wow. thing, the easiest thing to do is to wipe your face and that's it. The area underneath your jaw is not from your face. So you don't have to wash this. This is your face and this is what you have to wash. And Allah knows best. Adi Kanul from Nigeria. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum yeah, Salaam. Um, I would like to visit the children of my uh, my brother. Um, he is not around, you know. The children are like um, 10 years old maximum. Um, so, but can I call his wife to say, okay, I'm coming to visit you, or would that be impermissible because I'll be visiting the children? But no, I'm actually visiting the children, not the wife. But is that uh, you know, permissible for me to visit the children? If you there know? are no other adults with you or in the house, this is inappropriate. Even if your intention is pure to visit your nephews and nieces, but anyone who would see you enter the house of your own brother when he's absent, when there are, there are no adults, knowing that only your sister-in-law is in the house, would think dubiously of you and would doubt you. So this is totally inappropriate. And subhanAllah, your addiction to meeting them or you being fond of meeting them can wait. Or you can ask your sister-in-law to send them out so that you can take them out or to visit you at your house, etc. But not to go to your brother's house when he's not there and where there are no adults. Muhammad from the US. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum <coughs> salam Allah. <coughs> Sorry, I got a sore throat. Um, so the Prophet stopped Islam said, and I quote, when you sit following every two rakahs, then say that the shahud, and so on and so forth, then choose any supplication that you like and call Allah the Almighty with it, end quote. Sheikh Albani writes under this authentic hadith in his commentary, and I quote, this hadith shows a tremendous benefit it is the permissibility of supplicating after the first tashahud. 
And I did not find any other imams other than Ibn Hazm who had this viewpoint and he was correct. So what is apparent is that it is permissible to supplicate in every tashahud, even if followed by saying salam in a quote. Sheikh, um, based on this authentic evidence, what I wanted to ask you was, would it be considered bidda or an innovation if I were to make a supplication after the first tashahud and all my obligatory and optional and sunnah prayers? Jazakallah. Wajazakum. First of all, the hadith is crystal clear but it does not indicate whether this is the first tashahud or the second tashahud. So those who said it is in any tashahud, as you've quoted about Sheikh al-Albani and Imam ibn Hazm, they have an evidence. However, if you look at the other evidences, you will find that the Prophet والسلام, used to offer a tahiyyat in the first tashahud, and he was very quick in it, as per the hadith of Wail ibn Hujr, may Allah be pleased with him and others. So he used to immediately stand up without giving any time for dua or taking his time in it. So the first tashahud by nature, by sunnah, is very prompt and quick, which indicates that there was no time for dua. Alongside the issue that the vast majority of scholars state that this hadith is particularly referring to the last tashahud, which is followed by salam. So it's not the first tashahud, rather it's the last tashahud. And I've asked some of the major scholars about this and they stated what I just did. Therefore, if a person is on his own, I would say that it is not recommended to do it and he should delay it until the last tashahud. If he's praying behind an imam and the imam takes his time in the first tashahud, then he may uh, um, uh, supplicate and make dua according to this hadith rather than sitting there idle doing nothing. But if he's on his own, then it's best to be with the majority of the scholars and delay it to the last tashahud and Allah Azza wa knows best. Beckham from UK. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam, flaw barakatu. Um, my grandma is non Muslim um, and I'm taking care of her. Um, but she has strong feelings towards Christmas, but I'm a bit confused. So, what am I allowed to do when I see her unhappy on this day without intending to celebrate? Like, can I distract her with halal things, organize a walk? I feel like trying to make her happy on this day will make me a hypocrite. On the contrary, Akhi, what is prohibited for us as Muslims is to celebrate that day or to congratulate non-Muslims with it. But to be happy or to make people happy, not because of that particular day, rather because they're depressed or it's your nature to make people happy, there's nothing wrong in that at all. Nobody said that this occasion we should all be gloomy and frowning and uh, uh, mourn one another. On the contrary, be normal. And if you see your grandmother or any of your loved ones, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, being unhappy and you want to make them happy with halal things, not because of that particular day, rather throughout the whole year, this is totally permissible, inshallah. Sharon from India. Sharon? Your line is not clear, Sharon. I'm, I'm afraid I can't hear anything. Anna from Uganda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When I started learning more about Islam, I got to know that uh, when Allah tests you, then he loves you. So I got to know was like, uh, oh Allah, test me the most hardest test and listen to 
Yes, Anna. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh. When I started learning more about Islam. Right. Yes. Are you hearing me, Sheikh? Yes. When I started learning more about Islam, I got to learn that Allah tests you, then he loves you. So I invoked Allah and I was like, oh, Allah test me with the most hardest test and let me pass all of them. Did I do something wrong? Yes. Indeed, you've done a very grave and serious uh, uh, wrong thing. Instead of asking Allah to test you, ask him to grant you al-afiyah. The Prophet والسلام, once visited one of his companions and he got so sick that he was like a, uh, um, he lost all of his weight. He's, he was like skin over bones. So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, did you make any dua? Yeah, this is strange. What's happening to you? I don't see any symptoms of illness or sickness. So why is this happening to you? Did you make any dua? So the man said, yes, O Prophet of Allah. I used to say, O Allah, whatever you were storing for me on the day of judgment as torment, make it happen now in this life so I would not have any sins when I meet you. And the Prophet was, alayhi salatu wasalam, shocked. He said, subhanallah, who can tolerate such a thing? Shouldn't you have asked Allah for al-afiyah? And this was a way of the Prophet, alayhi salam, of telling us never ever make dua against yourself or ask Allah to test you because you will not make it or ask Allah to test you and make you make the test and pass it. No, Th this is illogical. If you, if you know that Allah answers dua and Allah accepts your dua, might as well ask him to forgive your sins, period. That's it. Ask him to love you without testing. Mutarraf ibn Abdullah, one of the great scholars, used to say, to be given wealth and health and I be show my gratitude to Allah is better from me than to be tested with poverty and illness and be patient. These are two tests from Allah. You could be healthy and wealthy, and you could be poor and sick. Which one would you choose? It's illogical for people to choose. So, no, 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 I want Allah to love me more and to make me poor and sick. No, because they've been given by Allah himself. So ask for health and wealth and al-afiyah, which is all good things in life. Forgiveness, health, wealth, uh, well-being, all of this goes under, under, under the, uh, the umbrella of al-afiyah. Ask Allah for al-afiyah. This is the best thing. After certainty, you may ask Allah Azza wa for. So do not ever ask Allah to test you because you will fail. Don't ever ask Allah for a test. Rather, ask him for al-afiyah. Abrar from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Shaykh. Uh, can the people in the control mute all participants in Zoom except those? Uh, Abrar? Yes, yes, Shaykh. Yes. Uh, I'm being distracted by the music in the background. I'm being distracted as well. I don't know what's happening. Now I don't hear anything. Yes. Okay, I think uh, Abrar. Uh, Horam from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam to Allah. Sheikh, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling great, alhamdulillah. 
Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, this is a question for a female, from a female, in her own words. On the 11th day of my period, when I checked inside with tissue, I didn't see any prominent colored discharge, but tiny brown granules, like tiny dots, which seemed like remains of menstrual cloths. Uh, if on the 12th day, there was, they were very tiny, just one or two dots, like tip of the needle, but on the 13th and 14th day, they were again uh, comparatively bigger and prominent in size. Now, if these granules continue even after the 15th day, two, should she simply take bath on 15th day and start praying or would she have to make up for the previous days? Two, if that uh, if that will be categorized as istahad. No, and, she, uh, she, just... she should, she should uh, perform... Her ghusl on the 15th day without making up any of her prayers. But if this continues on, she should only stop for the duration of her usual period in the past. But from now on, because of the, these 15 days that she was in doubt, she must not make up any prayer. But on the 15th day, she makes her ghusl and starts to pray and makes wudu for every prayer uh, when the adhan is called and she can resume her normal life. When the time of the month where she usually gets her period, and this continues with her, this is the time where she should stop for seven or eight days as be, uh, she used to do before. And afterwards, she should take ghusl immediately and continue to pray and consider herself as istihada because this is continuous all uh, um, the month around. Hamid from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam. My, my question is, my question is, when performing rukia and reciting um, ayat al kursi or the last two verses of Surah al-Baqarah, should we seek refuge with Allah from the Shaitan um, at the beginning? And also, should we say Amin every time we recite the Fatiha, even when we are doing it for rukia? First of all, saying Amin after the Fatiha is a highly recommended Sunnah. And if one skips it, the Fatiha is not affected. So it's recommended that you say it, but there's no problem in skipping it. Second of all, you say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim only once in the beginning, and this suffices for everything you do afterwards, and you don't repeat it be, uh, before every Fatiha or every Ayatul Kursi or every uh, Mu'awwadat. No, you don't. You just say it once, and Allah knows best. Belly from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, uh, don't scold me for praising, please. Uh, I just wish I could explain to you how much you helped me in my dark times. I was really depressed and broken, and then Allah sent you. And just thank you, and I want to tell you that I am not your fan. I am a whole air conditioner of yours now. Alhamdulillah. So may Allah bless you. May Allah bless you, reward you, and may Allah give you everything your heart desires. I mean, and, and you may Allah well. give you lots of hayat. May Allah give you lots of hayat because we need you. Barakallah feekum, uh, What's your question, buddy? Uh, my question is, whenever any debating topic comes, like uh, you said this and any other sheikh uh, said the opposite. So I go like, uh, Sheikh Asim said this, so this must be the right answer. So is this correct to be a blind follower of any sheikhs and how can I fix this? Okay, first of all, it is totally wrong to be a blind follower of any person on earth other than the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. No one is infallible except the Prophet ﷺ. Not even the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Not Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, let alone Sheikh so-and-so or scholar so-and-so. So number one is no one is to be followed blindly, regardless of who they are, except the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Second of all, when people differ, so scholar so-and-so and scholar so-and-so, how do we evaluate which one is saying the truth or which one is more authentic or closer to the truth than the other? Is it through their biceps, the size of it? Or is it by the many followers? 
on Instagram or on YouTube or on whatever? Of course not. Allah Azza wa Jal made a very clear way to determine which scholar is right and which scholar is not. When Allah says, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ If you ever differed or argued or disputed over an issue, refer it back to Allah and to the Messenger والسلام, if you believe in Allah in the Day of Judgment. How do we refer it back to Allah and to the Prophet والسلام, By referring it back to the Quran and to the Sunnah. And this is why in so many places, in our families, in our communities, we are plagued by blind following the scholars or the schools of thought. Sometimes disputes happen in the same house when a brother fights with his father or with his siblings or a sister fights with her mother because they blindly follow a particular school of thought. And you come and say, Sheikh Asim said, who in the heck is Sheikh Asim? Let him go to wherever he wants. Who is he? And they're right. So if you say Sheikh so-and-so, Sheikh so-and-so, they will say, okay, we have also Sheikh so-and-so and Sheikh so-and-so. Why don't you follow them? Is it the size of the biceps? Is it the number of the followers? Is it the tone of their skin? No. It is by Quran and Sunnah. And this is why we tell you, don't take from me or him. Take from the Quran and Sunnah. Whenever we say something, we should back it up by قال الله قال النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام. So when you speak to them, don't say to them, Sheikh so-and-so said. Because they will counter that by saying, well, Sheikh so-and-so said something different. Rather say to them, Allah says in the Quran, or the Prophet Muhammad said in Sahih al-Bukhari. This would shut them off totally because what can they do to refute what you're saying if they don't know any verse of the Quran or authentic hadith that can counter it? They're lost. They have to raise the white flag and say, we surrender, we believe and follow. Or they would be questioning their Islam because they rather fo follow Tom, Dick, or Harry rather than follow Qala Allah, Qala Rasul, rather than following the Quran and the Sunnah, which is a grave uh, uh, mistake and a sin. So this is the best way of talking to people, and Allah knows best. Ayan from U.S., Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum salam to Allah. I have three um, scenarios. Can you tell me if they're kufr or shirk or not? Um, three is too much, Ayan. Come, I mean, Ayan, you know that's the, the, the routine. You know the drill. We can only entertain one question. Imagine if everyone has a scenario of like five uh, pages long. I can't entertain this. So give me one scenario and then we will look into the others later on, inshallah. Um... If I'm afraid to advise someone, is this go for a shirk? The fear that would take a person out of the fold of Islam is the fear that is a mixture of revering Allah Azza wa Jal or glorifying or worshipping. This can only be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I fear a lion or a black mamba. I fear gators. I fear snakes. I fear scorpions. I fear, maybe some people fear the dark, fearing the jinn. All of this is not shirk or kufr. This is natural fear. Fire is in front of you. You're appalled and step back. Hey, you're afraid. You're a kafir. Don't fear other than Allah. Okay, what do you want me to do? Go in? You be my guest. You don't fear Allah. You don't fear other than Allah. <laughs> be my guest. This is natural fear, Akhi. So if you fear someone 
or you're shy of saying or doing something because of someone, this is not shirk or kufr. Because the fear of Allah includes revering Allah Azza wa Jal, glorifying Allah, worshiping Allah, being submissive to Allah, and all of this is not happening here when you fear someone or you're shy from someone Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're going to talk about the book, Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, trained his companions to be modest. Hakim bin Hizam, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I asked the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he gave me, then I asked him another two times, and each time he gave me. Then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told me, O oh, Hakim, this life is green and beautiful, so whoever takes it without greed or persisting on asking for it will have blessing in it. And whoever takes it while making it close to their heart will not have blessing in it. They will be like the one who eats without becoming full. The hand that is higher giving the poor is better than the one that is lower receiving from others. So I said, O Messenger of Allah, by him who has sent you with the truth, I will never ask anyone for money until I die. Afterwards, Abu Bakr, May Allah be pleased with him, called Hakim. May Allah be pleased with him, in order to give him, but he refused to take. And the same with Umar. So Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, O Muslims, you are my witness that I have offered some of this booty to Hakim, but he refused to take it. Hakim did not take money from anyone after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until he died. Reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have Brother Ammar from the UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Sheikh, I just wanted to ask about a hadith. Um, it was narrated that once the Prophet Ali sallallahu alayhi wa was resting in the house of Mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and Abu, Abu Bakr radiallahu, radiallahu anhu came, and the cloth on the Prophet's leg was um, uncovered, and he didn't do anything. But then Osman radiallahu ta'ala anha came, and he immediately covered his leg. So Mother Aisha inquired about this. And the Prophet said that, why should I not feel shy from whom the angels feel shy from? <coughs> Sorry. Why should I not feel shy from the one whom angels feel shy from? So I just wanted to ask, like, what does it, what did the Prophet mean by this, like, the angels feel shy from him? The hadith that Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, was among the most bashful of all the companions. And this was a characteristic in him that he was shy from things that would bring bad reputation to his name, from things that were immodest, more than anyone else, to the extent that it was reported in his biography that he never touched his private part at all with his right hand since he gave the Pledge of Allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ because he shook his hands with the Prophet ﷺ. Though it is permissible to touch one's private part with the right hands, but the prohibition is when urinating or when cleaning yourself after answering the call of nature to use your right. But other than that, it's permissible. It was also reported that he never took a shower nude, that he always had a piece of cloth covering him self when he took a shower or a bath because of his bashfulness. Now, 
Having said that, this is not something that would deter him from enforcing what is righteous and virtuous and forbidding what is evil and vice because he was the third Khalifa and you cannot run a country by saying, oh, I'm bashful. I can't order this or that. No, he was determined in so many things and he was decisive in so many things and this had nothing to do with his modesty and bashfulness. And the hadith shows us that whomever deals and treats with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a fashion, in a way that we deal with him out of respect in the same fashion. So those who fear Allah azza wa jal, we fear them. We give them the, the amount of respect that is equivalent to their fear of Allah. Those who are generous, for the sake of Allah, when we deal with them, we're generous with them. Why? Why do you treat him better than X, Y, Z? Well, he's generous in giving charity, so might as well I be generous with him whenever I deal with him. This is what the Prophet's message was, والسلام, and also to highlight the importance of being bashful and uh, modest at all time, and Allah knows best. A man from India. Come on. Aman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, uh, when we sit in Atikaf, we have to stay awake whole 10 nights. So unfortunately, to rest, we have to sleep in the daytime. So now my question is, can you give me a direction how to balance sleep in Atikaf? Because... I always sleep after Fajr till the Dhuhr, which I want to utilize this time. Jazakum <coughs> khairan. What jazakum? First of all, i'tikaf, which is seclusion, is a highly recommended sunnah in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. The Prophet ﷺ observed it the most of his life <laughs> in Medina and skipped it only once. So this is the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And it is a sunnah indeed to revive the nights of these last 10 nights more than the daytime. And we are humans. We have to have rest time. So if the nighttime is more valuable than the daytime, it would be illogical to spend your nighttime sleeping and trying to do something beneficial in the daytime because the value is different. And the norm is that you sleep during the daytime from Fajr till Dhuhr. That is pretty uh, uh, um, normal as mentioned in Surah Al-Muzammil that during the daytime you have a lot of hours of sleep if you wish. So. Allah is telling us that if you want to utilize the night time, which is the best thing to do when worshiping Allah. Why? Because it's quiet. It is the time when the vast majority of people are asleep. And it is best for you not to show off. Unlike in the daytime when everybody is looking at you, but at night time everybody is asleep. When you worship Allah, you're more sincere as people are not aware of what you're doing. So it is best for you during the last 10 nights of Ramadan to sleep during the daytime without uh, skipping Salat, the fourth Salat, and Allah knows best. Adam from the UK. Adam. <laughs> Amir from the U.S. <laughs> Amir. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Yeah, um, so Sheikh, I have some debts uh, I had to pay off, right? And I was wondering, like, is it okay for me to, like, uh, mm -hmm. my mom, you know, she usually buys things for me. And I was wondering, like, she wouldn't, like, you know, pay for my debts or anything like that. I was wondering if it's, 
if it's okay for like uh me to ask you know my mom to like get a like a gym membership for me that's really cheap or something like that instead of uh amir your mom is your mom you can ask her for anything and if she's willing and giving that's that's fine who else in this world do we have the audacity to go and ask and beg other than our parents. So we go to them and we ask. And if they give, that's the nature of parents. And if they refrain or decline our request, we have no ill feelings, none whatsoever. So go ahead, Akhi, ask your mom for a membership, for paying you part of your loans, for uh, buying you a gift and anything. She's your mother and she loves doing this for your sake and Allah knows best. Abdul Mateen from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, I have some health issues. I want to tell it to my teacher. He teaches Quran, but I want to tell him secretly because uh, if I tell him in front of my Muslim friends, they will bully me. So I am afraid of being bullied. Mm -hmm. I want to tell him secretly. Say, Sheikh, is this showing off? Is this shirk? Jazakallah khair. Wajizak, there is no shirk and there is no showing off and there is no kufr in that, none whatsoever. But if you're afraid of people bullying you, you have to be certain that your teacher would not leak your secret. Because if it's a secret, keep it as a secret. Don't tell people about it. Leave it between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. There is a possibility once you tell someone that they would tell another. And it, it would not become a secret anymore. But concealing it from the others so that they would not bully you, there is no problem in that. And it's very normal and natural. Abdul Malik from France. Hello, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, my blood spoil whenever people like apostate prophet and Adam secret disrespects our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sheikh, I become very much angry. I don't know what to do whenever they disrespect our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sheikh, what to do in these kind of situations? First of all, you have to understand that if your blood does not boil whenever the prophet sallallahu alaihi is insulted or the religion of Allah, or the Qur'an, or anything related to Islam, then you're not a real Muslim. This is a natural reaction to any insult of, the, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the Messenger, والسلام, or the Qur'an, or any part of our religion. But as Muslims, we have to evaluate our reaction in accordance to the results of such a reaction, the consequences. For example, when some of the hypocrites at the time of the Prophet ﷺ would say something that was offensive or inappropriate and the Prophet would be angered by it ﷺ, some of the companions used to stand up and say, O oh, Prophet of Allah, permit me to go and decapitate him, to take his head off for what he had done. Listen to the answer of the Prophet ﷺ. And remember, the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of Allah. Whatever he does is by the command of Allah Azza wa Jal. So if he would have said to this companion, go ahead and kill him, that would have been pretty normal. Because he, the Prophet ﷺ, is executing whatever Allah is telling him to do. But he would never do that. He would say, no, I don't want people to talk and say that Muhammad is killing his companions. Out there, the people don't know the circumstances, the reasons and the justifications of your action. Therefore, they would jump the gun and they would say, look, this is what Islam teaches his followers. It's a religion of violence. It's a barbaric religion. It's this, it's that. 
and this is what the media is doing, due to an impulsive reaction. Yes, the guy says, I'm hot-blooded, and this is why I did what I had done. But this does not justify your action, my friend. You've already tarnished the reputation of Islam. You've caused more damage than the previous insult. What did we benefit? Nothing. What did Islam benefit? Nothing. Who benefited? Only you, because your, bo your, your blood was boiling and you wanted to calm down, so you did what you had done. But this heinous act of yours is unjustifiable. Therefore, always weigh the pros and cons of your reaction. And if it meant that you play it diplomatically and safely so that you turn the tables on their heads and show the whole world how bad people they are and how good people we are, this is excellent public relationship. And this is what Islam promotes and Allah knows best. Khan from India. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So my question today is a follow-up of the yesterday's 10,000 real investment question. Now the conditions are that I give 10,000 real to the person to buy some products and sell in his shop. So we have a deal that he sells the product and does the legwork and the profit is divided, suppose 30, 70. If the product was not sold and it expired, then that's a loss. So if the product is sold for 20,000, that means 10,000 is the profit of which I get 30% and 10,000 original amount is recovered, which will again be used to buy more products and this goes on. Now the doubt is that when I want to stop after some time, so this time the 10,000 was used for buying products and sold for 20,000. So the 10,000 profit is divided 30, 70 and the original amount of 10,000 was also recovered and that money comes back to me. So I just wanted to confirm, is this okay now? Yeah, yeah, this is 100% fine. This is totally uh, legitimate and legal and Islamic. There is nothing wrong in that. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Sayyid from Singapore. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Okay, let's say if someone has a thick beard and they put oil in it to smoothen it, uh, so before making wudu, do they have to like get the oil out by using soap or something? And I uh, just wanted to say, Sheikh, like your beard looks very well groomed. So if you have like any tips like how to maintain a thick beard, that will be really helpful. Thanks. Barakallah feek. First of all, I don't do anything to my beard at all, alhamdulillah. I don't um, groom it. I just brush it once or twice a day. I shampoo it whenever... My wife complains of the smell, but I try to my level best to soak it in perfumes. It's always smelling nice, alhamdulillah. Uh, I don't use any conditioners or oil or, or the likes. It's from Allah Azza wa Jal, alhamdulillah. Secondly, the oil usually is absorbed by the skin and by the hair. So it does not uh, constitute a layer as in the case of hair gel, for example. Because hair gel, you feel that it's like wood. It, it feels like some, there is a, a layer, a substance. And this prevents the water from reaching that area. In the hair, it's permissible to use hair gel and to wipe over it in wudu because this was done by the Prophet ﷺ. So this is an exception. Other than that, the hair of the beard, as we use oil to it, yes, it's oily if I touch it, but it's usually observed and it's just, just the lubricants that is felt, not that there is a layer on top of it. So therefore, if you just wash your beard, and this is what's uh, required to wash the face and the external part of the beard. The sunnah is to put water in your hand and you do this. And this symbolic gesture does not cover your, your whole face and the chins and the jaws and what's underneath. It's just what the Prophet did and we follow suit and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. 
Naeem from India. Ya yeah, Naeem. Amreen from India. Amreen. I hope people of India are not boycotting us. Khalilullah from Nigeria. No, yes, Khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Naam, this is Khalilullah. Hayyak Allah, what can I do for you? Naam. Uh, so, Sheikh, I wanted to ask if I um, entered a masjid where I've not prayed before, and um, so maybe due to the way they do the demarcation facing the Qibla, I face the wrong, um, the wrong direction. So after praying with, uh, with my other guys and some of uh, the guys that are, you know, living in the area came in and uh, let us know that, oh, we actually face the wrong Qibla to pray. Should we repeat our prayer? Jazakum Allah Jazakum. Praying to the direction of the Qibla is one of the conditions of Salat. It's like wudu. If you don't have it, the Salat is invalid. However, if a person does his level best, for example, he asks a Muslim individual, Salaam Alaikum, Alaikum Salaam. Where's the direction of the Qibla? It's this way. And I pray according to what he directed me to. He's a Muslim. And after finishing the prayer, someone comes and says, whoa, the Qibla is this way, the opposite direction. Should I repeat? The answer is no, because I acted upon a reliable Muslim who told me where the direction is, and he texts the sin if there's any. Likewise, if I enter a city, and I don't know where the Qibla is. The scholars all say in the books of, of fiqh that you look at the direction where the masjid is built towards. So you see the masjid structure, and the mihrab is in the front. So I know that this is the direction of the Qibla. And I pray accordingly. Afterwards, if someone says, no, the Qibla is the other way around. Well, this is a masjid. Why is it erected on this? direction. Oh, it was a mistake. It was this. It was that. Either way, I did my due diligence and I prayed according to what Allah told me at that time. And my prayer is valid. So those who entered the masjid and prayed according to the structure of the masjid and direction of masjid, they did the right thing and their prayer is valid, inshallah. Safiya from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Shaq. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is, if, you, if it's Maghrib prayer and you join someone on second rakat, tasha'ud, how do you pray that prayer? Jazakallah khair. Wa jazakum. Take it as a rule of thumb, Safiya. And what is the rule of thumb? Whatever you begin with your imam, it is your first rak'ah, regardless of which rak'ah the imam is in. If I join the imam in his third rak'ah, this is my first. The imam sits for tashahud, I sit with him. He offers salam, I stand up. What should I pray? Well, I've already done my first, so I pray the second, sit in the tashahud, third, sit in the tashahud and the salutation, the root, sharif, and then offer salam. So, to look at your scenario, you join the imam in his second rak'ah, which is your first. So you pray with the imam, you sit with the imam in the first tashahud, and you make the tashahud with him. He stands for his third, which is your second. And you sit with him in the last of his tashahud and the salutation upon the Prophet and he makes salam. You stand up for your third rak'ah, and you pray on your own. You sit for tahiyyat, you sit for salutation upon the Prophet and you offer salam. 
you say, okay, Sheikh, these three rak'ahs, I sat in the first and second and third. The pro there's no problem in that. Your prayer is totally uh, 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 correct and valid and Allah knows best. Rajab from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Is your name correct? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. What can I do for you, Akhi? Sheikh, my question is, what is your advice to people who say that if you read Hadith and Quran from translation in your language directly, you will be astray or you will become gumrah? So you will become what? Say. You will lead astray. Okay. First of all, Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah to the best of your ability. So if this is the best of my ability, I don't speak Arabic, I don't speak English, I don't speak uh, uh, German or French, and the only book of uh, uh, tafsir or the translation of the meanings of the Holy Quran or the Noble Quran and of the Sunnah are found in Tamil or in Urdu. And you're telling me if I read it, I'll go astray. So what should I do? Just look at the stars and do nothing? No. This is totally bogus. And whoever says this wants you to remain in the state of ignorance till the day you die. I always say this to my congregation. I went once to, I think, maybe the Red Mosque, or I don't know what color it was, somewhere in India. And I went to pray Jumu'ah there. And mashallah, the masjid was packed. And the Imam came, and he was like maybe 150 years old. Something, whoa. So, and I'm getting there. So I'm not making fun of old people. I'm, I'm already uh, half that age. So he went in. He delivered the khutbah. Now, I'm an Arab. I did not understand a word of what he said except, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa rasulillah. He was reading from a book. And you can see flies coming out of it. It was an ancient book. And probably he read it like a gazillion times. And I was looking around. And everybody else could not understand a word. And the guy gave two khutbas, and he started the prayer. Now, I didn't understand the khutbah. Those natives did not understand the khutbah. So the most likely, the imam was the only one who understood it, and I'm really doubtful if he did understand what he read. What is the use of Friday khutbah if it's wasted like this once a week and no one understands anything and no one gets the messages of this beautiful religion. This is why I say, when you are in a country that don't speak Arabic, don't give your khutbah in Arabic. Just say, say the shahadatain, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa shahadu Muhammad Rasulullah, and recite an ayah, ya ayu ladhina amanu taqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa anta muslimun. And then go ahead and speak in the native language of the, of the country or in English where everybody understands and benefits and learn their religion rather than just reading something that nobody understands what you're reading. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet next week. Saturday, inshallah. I'll leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين